Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Whiskey Wednesdays. Uh, today, I'm joined by Mike Henneberger, a music journalist and Emmy-winning producer, and who also just put out um, a new mixtape memoir called Rock Bottom at the Renaissance. I have it right here. I read it. It was amazing. Um, we have a lot to unpack in this book, and I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, me too. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thanks for, for having me and thanks for spreading the word about this and thanks for reading it. Yeah. To preface, this book was mostly written during like a weekend long stay at uh, the Times Square Renaissance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I started it back in uh, 2011, actually. So like the um, that present day, because for those who haven't read it, it's like every other chapter's present day and then like a flashback. Um, and that present day part takes place in 2000, that weekend in the hotel. So um, yeah, a lot of that stuff I wrote, you know, either as I was experiencing it or like right after, which it all says in the book, like there's a point where I'm writing about something and I refer to it as happening yesterday or something. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I wrote a lot of it that weekend yeah and that was like because of a stay that you had won um a contest a photography contest and you were put up at this hotel and that was your prize yeah yeah so i've i've been doing or i mean it's been a while since i've done concert photography um but i did it for a very long time um and i won this concert photography contest that live nation and nikon held um back then and uh, I took with this photo of Set Your Goals um, playing Warp Tour in 2010. Nice. Um, but yeah, so um, when I was in Texas, I where which is where I'm from, I my brother and I started a magazine where I would write music journalism stuff there. Um, and every year I would cover all the tech like the three Texas Warp Tour dates. So I was just like that year. Um, shooting Warp Tour and got this really cool shot of Set Your Goals and yeah, uh, that one and I, I won a, uh, the, the prize was um, tickets to any Live Nation concert in the in the country, um, three nights at a hotel and car and airfare too, but I was already living in New York and so um, yeah, I just, I just got tickets to go see Portishead in New York, which was awesome and I also write about that in the book. Um, but yeah, so that, I was just, and it's crazy that like, actually, I always say I love doing these, having these conversations because I always like realize something new about the book. And I've actually never really just thought about how like, if I hadn't won that contest, this book probably wouldn't exist. Um, so yeah, that's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask because it seemed like as you were writing, you had the intention of writing going into this weekend. Um, but as you're saying, if you're not sure if that probably would have even come out from being there. Yeah, <clears throat> I had the intention of writing, um, and I mentioned that in the book too, but I didn't know what I was going to write. You know, like this book starts off with me walking to the hotel. Like the first chapter is me leaving work and going to the hotel for this. So, like, I didn't have it's not something that was in my head before because it hadn't happened yet. Um, and so I didn't know what I was going to write. I just knew that I hadn't really. I had kind of lost my focus on writing um, and uh, or like, you know, I was doing it as a job, but I wasn't doing it as like a, you know, pas passionately and like working on my own things. Um, and so I, I felt like I needed to do that. And so, yeah, I was just definitely like in, in intending to write. I just didn't know what was going to write, what I was going to write or what was going to come out of that. Yeah. And um, it, it seems like a lot of the stuff you wrote while you were there is very like stream of consciousness. It's just what came out of your head at that moment. And that yeah. actually made it kind of cool to just see how you were feeling at that moment. And it, it gives you a better sense of who you are as a person, as a, as a writer. And it made a lot of the other stories make more sense too. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's kind of like the scary part about it too, is that like, it's all very real. And for those who haven't read about it, or read it, there's like a lot of um, drug abuse in it. And 
it's you know about me struggling with my major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder and you know when you struggle with those things bringing in prescription drugs that you can abuse and throwing alcohol on top of that is never a good idea and so this book is about that very bad idea <laughs> like um and so because of that i mean it, it was all very stream of consciousness and i um when i left the hotel that weekend um i i didn't touch that book for like over a year because of how scary and that weekend was i didn't want to like go back into that headspace you know if if i i mean when you get into that headspace you don't really have control of what you're doing so i couldn't like i definitely got there again but i wasn't like oh i should go back to the book and write you know because you're just like dealing with the shit in your head um and then I didn't want to force myself to get back into that headspace to go do it. Um, but eventually, I think, I guess as I got better or as I got, you know, more healthy, um, it was easier for me to go back to it and finish it because it, it became like something different for me in that, like, it was something that was always important to me. And just in the same as that weekend that I needed to focus on writing again, it was my it was now the thing that like i was almost done with and i needed to get and i needed to finish you know mm -hmm. um and so it, it took about a, a year um and f fortunately and unfortunately i wasn't like that much healthier so i wasn't as far away from the headspace as i would have liked to have been so it, it wasn't that difficult to to finish it and there wasn't much left i mean i like threw some more flashbacks and stuff in there but um, but yeah, the stuff that I wrote in the hotel, I really tried to not touch and not edit because I wanted people to experience what I was feeling as much as they could. Um, so yeah, the, really the, the most of the editing I did to it was just to like make it make sense since I wrote it hopped up on pills and booze. Yeah, I, I think that was definitely a good idea because people who've never experienced something like that it's it's a very um raw uh depiction of yeah something. and that's kind of one of the things that actually finally inspired me to put it out because even when i did finish it i was scared to put it out because i was still dealing with a lot of that stuff myself and um i didn't want people around me to know how bad my head was or how messed up it was um and so it really took me getting mentally healthier and then I, and then reading it and feeling like I, I came a long way from it. But one day, like in like 2015 or 2016, I read it and I just felt like I was reading a novel about somebody else. And I realized that like, it was helping me as somebody with these mental health issues, but it, it also captures it so well that I, I, the thought I had in my head was like, this is going to help a lot of people who don't deal with this stuff and might have a friend who does because everybody, everybody experiences it differently, but it's still a good like description of what you like, how, how little sense it makes, you know, when you're dealing with depression and anxiety. And so I hope that it, it not only helps people who are dealing with it, but helps people who have loved ones who are dealing with it. Yeah. I think that, that's really great that you thought of that and decided to put, you know, your experience out there for other people to take in and uh, receive. Uh, so you you sat on the book for a little bit. Yeah. Although, and I think you just put it out a few months ago, right? Yeah, it came, out in, it came out in June. Oh, back in June. Okay. Um, and how long did it take for you to decide that you were, were ready to release it and then going through the release process. Yeah, so like, I think it was in 20, like I said, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was like 2016 that I thought, I felt like I was comfortable putting it out in regards to like my own struggles with it. But then a hard part also was just like, I, I met my wife in like 2014 um, and we got married in 2015. And so it was also really hard for me, like she's always known about it, but not in detail. Um, and so it was always hard for me for like, once I 
you know, met her, but also like her family and stuff. Cause I'm not like super close with my immediate family. Um, and so there was never really anybody in my life whose judgment I was afraid of um, until like their family came into my life. Um, but they're all great. And like the, everybody who knows me in life now knows who I am now. And so I think like now for me, that book shows how fucked up I was back then, but it also shows how far I've come. And that's like, that's worth being proud of, you know? So no matter what can embarrass me from that book, like I have so much to be proud of now that it doesn't even matter. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a lot of people don't think about that, about people often, whereas like, oh, well, they did that thing in the past or they were like this in the past. And yeah. that's just how they think of somebody. And that's not how it is. People change and people grow. And that's what life is about, yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah, no, and we should want that for people and we should give people that chance you know, um, and I, I think I've, I think I've, uh, you know, it's also about like those you give that chance to earning it. And, you know, I think I, I, I work very hard to kind of keep my head straight and be a better person. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think letting people have that chance encourages them to put that work in. Um, so yeah, it's really important. Yeah. And there's, there is a lot of really personal stories in this book yeah. um, that deal with other people. Do they, did they know that this was being written about, that you were going to publish it? <laughs> mm, no, um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Um, a couple of them might, <laughs> because like, they're still kind of in my friend circle orbit. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, I'm sure they do, but it's like, I don't think I really made anybody, like I looked the worst in the book, you know, like, and then anybody who, I mean, I, I, anybody who looks bad in it, I, I, I kind of like excuse or forgive, you know, like, um, like there's one chapter. Uh, so for those who again, haven't read it, the flashbacks are flashbacks to relationships I had in New York city. Um, where I thought, you know, I was finding the real thing, but it turned out to not be. Um, and in one of those stories, you know, one of the girls looks really bad because she treated me like shit. But, but in the end, I say like, you know, I, I like kind of let her off the hook because of how young she was, you know, or she was 24. She wasn't like young. Um, she was 24 and I say like I did a lot of shitty things when I was 24 and I hurt friends when I was 24 and I hurt people when I was 24. So like I, I excused her, you know, um, I kind of like, I don't learn from my mistakes, you know, like that's the thing. It's not that they were horrible people. It's that I just didn't learn from them. And like I saw the red flags and I didn't, and I ignored them, you know? So really it's like, I, th I think it's clear that I get myself, I got myself into those situations myself, you know? Um, and the present day of that book, I'm in another situation like that. And so it's really just like, I mean, if you really look at it closely, it's it's kind of like my, it's all my fault, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think you can definitely, um, you, you definitely depict that well. And you, I think you even wrote in a few of the chapters about like, well, it's my fault because I'm just, so into being in love or like wanting to find love yeah. and find the girl and that's just what's in my head and yeah exactly yeah uh, and and you know what and that's part of the whole like mental health thing too is that you it's just like addiction like it tricks you into thinking you need this thing or it tricks you into thinking that that thing is more important than it really is and and so that's that's really what this book is about you know it, it on the surface it sure it's like a it's like a romance thing or like about you know relationships but it's really about what put me in that position in the first place to to continually feel as hurt as I did through those relationships it was all because of my head and the way I made things you know in my head yeah yeah and for people who struggle with 
like anxiety and depression like the thoughts like swirling in your head it's really hard to stop that yeah and it's it, it's interesting to see um the different scenarios where like you have to deal with those uh situations no yeah i've been there so many times and and it can be and that's the thing is like there's no logic to it um i mean it's the same like when people say like, oh, how'd that person kill themselves? They should have been so happy they had all this. There's no logic to any of it. Like that's that's why it's like an illness. It's like, it's, you know, it's not something that there's just an answer to. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, this book is definitely very, very a heavy read, but um, it, a very enlightening read too. And I also really like that it incorporates music, which is obviously, I think, your main love. Yes. Um, yeah. And each chapter is a new track to the coinciding like mixtape playlist. Yeah. Which I think is really cool. Did you um, think about that tie-in while you were writing it that weekend, or was that an afterthought? Um. It, no, it wasn't. It wasn't like an af it wasn't an afterthought some of the chapters came later but like the songs came later um but like like i said like the first chapter is happening like is like me going from work to the hotel so it's like almost real time and the song for that chapter is jimmy world's 23 because jimmy world's 23 came on my headphones when that stuff happened you know and i had written in that format before like i did a warp tour review um, in like 2008 where, and it's, it's kind of very similar to this format. Cause I went with this girl that I really liked and, um, I was leaving for the army like a couple days or week, like a couple days later. Um, and so it was like this, like big, I made it this huge, like romantic, like farewell to my like civilian life. And going to warp tour and like listening to Reliant K with this girl that I like am crazy about. Um, and so I had, I, I actually hadn't talked about that before. Um, but I, I, I wrote that warp tour review kind of in the same format as this. And that was in 2008. And so like, as I'm telling, as I'm reviewing the bands that I see, but like from the perspective of that guy dealing with all those things, yeah. the like the Reliant K lyrics will pop in there or I forget like Angels and Airwaves was there that year um Cobra Starship I think was there that year I can't remember which other lyrics I like put in there but so that same format um I had done that before mm -hmm. and in the past when I would write essays about music I would like interrupt the paragraphs with lyrics too I mean I did it a few times and so I guess that was just like what came to me in the hotel when I was writing that first chapter. Mm -hmm. um, Cause even the forward I wrote later or the introduction I wrote mm -hmm. later. Um, so the first thing I wrote was that Jimmy Eat World chapter and the song just was there, you know? Um, and then it's like Bayside chapter, Dangerous Summer chapter. And those are the two bands I always listen to when I'm like dealing with shit in my head. So they were definitely playing in the hotel when I was writing, you know, or when I was there drinking and popping pills. Um, and then, you know, the next chapter is Megan by the Smoking Popes and it's about a girl named Megan. And then there's like a Tudor Cinema Club chapter, which takes place at a Tudor Cinema Club concert and has flashbacks to Tudor Cinema Club shows. Um, and so, so yeah, there's different reasons for the songs. Um, like the last chapter that I wrote um and i won't spoil anything but it's super dark and um like i actually wrote that while i was feeling that way and there was no song it was not it was not there was no way for me to think of like oh well what should i put here you know it's like an intense dark chapter but then like as time passed and i heard that song uh, i just want to sell out my funeral by the wonder years it just captured everything I was trying to say in the book, you know? Um, and so that just fit there, you know? And I had, so like, there, there were times where that happened, like um, the, the Alkaline Trio chapter two was sorry about that. Like that song just fits that scenario so much um, that, it, that it went in there. But like, 
a lot of the present day chapters are dangerous summer songs because those are because that's the band I listen to when I'm like oh I'm actually wearing a dangerous summer shirt <laughs> um but yeah they're like my favorite band and they're because of their music's gotten me through so much yeah yeah and that's that's why I think it's a really cool idea to present it that way because I feel like a lot of people who like music they like it because it makes them feel a certain way during a certain time yeah and I personally always relate certain songs or albums to like specific years or times of my life and yeah just not what gets stuck in your head um so it's really relatable and yeah cool there there was a part towards i think towards the end where you talked about how you had been in um that christian ska band mm -hmm. around like 18 to 20. yeah um, and you got kicked out of the band and you didn't really know why but you kind of knew why um and you kind of mentioned that that was the catalyst for you to start like feeling these feelings of like loneliness and wanting to be loved and yeah i mean i don't i don't know if it was the catalyst for that but it was i mean it was definitely like a huge um and i think i mean i i do say that and i also say that like since like my parents got divorced you know like the the like mm -hmm. the like when my parents got divorced i was probably like eight or something so i mean i was i was still a little kid and didn't really I guess know how to equate feelings with like emotions and I think once you learn how to do that that's when you get really fucked up but um but yeah no like once that that band broke up or kind of kicked me out because what they did was they like we all had this meeting we would played for five years and we had this like meeting together and decided we were going to break up but then I found out that they were like practicing without me oh. and but they like started a new band and were writing new songs so they didn't like kick me out of that band, whatever. Um, but yeah, they were like my they were like my my best friends since like eighth grade through twenty one years old or twenty years old, and um, you know we went on like three tours together. We lived together, so like we were around each other all the time, um, and so it was the hardest heartbreak I've probably still ever had. You know. Um, Cause I, I mean, and I've, I've been in like long relationships, but still it's like losing all of your only friends. Um, and the thing you've been like working your hardest on for five years. Um, that was definitely one of the hardest things I've experienced. And as far as like emotionally, and then I just was alone cause I didn't have any friends and I didn't have anybody. So yeah, that was like, and actually, I mean, I guess it is kind of the catalyst for all this because it's when I started, you know, I played in another band after that, but I, it's when I started writing, like my brother and I started our, we started a zine that became the magazine that he runs now in Texas. Um, but we started a zine and it was just so we could write, you know? And, and so that's when I really started because before that I was just expressing my emotions through writing songs. And so, I didn't have that anymore because I'm not, I don't play guitar well. Um, and so I couldn't just like start writing my own songs. Um, and so I started, I just, yeah, that's kind of what launched me into just like writing for the zine and then which kicked it off to writing every other thing that I write. What was the name of that magazine that you and your brother started? It's, it, it's called The Vent. Mm -hmm. um, and we started it, it was a little zine like like this big uh, it was just like a piece of paper folded over you know um and so i mean it was multiple sheets but um and we would like kind of and this is 2001 you know or 2002 and it was like handwritten or typed and kind of put together on like photoshop and then we would go to like kinko's and xerox copy like we gave like the lo the local copy shop an ad in in it, so they would give us free copies, um, and it was called the Vent because our college newspaper was run by the college, so people couldn't really vent in it about like problems with the college. So we were giving people that outlet also. Um, mostly it was just us bitching about the college under fake names. Um, <laughs> but uh <laughs> but i mean it's not it's not like we, it didn't represent other people's thoughts 
Um, but so yeah, we just like made that and it was just a zine. And then, um, you know, we would go, we would drive like two and a half hours to San Antonio or four hours to Austin to go to concerts and we'd interview bands and we'd like review like punk and I mean, wasn't a lot of like emo back then. I guess, I don't know. We didn't really like think of it as emo, I guess. Um, but uh, but yeah, we would interview or we would like review all these indie albums and stuff because we lived in this shit small town far away from everything that didn't really get that stuff. So we wanted to like expose it to this area. Um, and so eventually my brother moved to Corpus Christi, which is like the city next to our little town and turned it into like an alternative newspaper. So he's been running this thing since, I mean, it's been probably 13 or 15 years. Um, uh -huh. He's been running a long time. I think it's been 13 years, but it's, it's just like the, you know, the magazine people pick up to find out what's going on in the city. Like there's the event calendar and all the bars and concert venues take ads in there and stuff. So yeah, he turned it into like his, his career for the last 13 years. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah um what was it like working with your brother on that publication because i remember reading in the book that your relationship was a little yeah <laughs> yeah it's like i say in the book like we're only good at working with each other for about six months like we we're very similar people and um that just clashes yeah. it's a shame because we're both pretty smart and funny and creative people and if we could work together, we might be able to do something really cool, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> so this book kind of ends on a bit of a cliffhanger. Um, we don't really know, you know, what's going to happen after this weekend. We still don't know what's going to happen to the girl, if you're going to ever be with the girl. Yeah. Um, I guess I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah it's like wait what happened to the girl we know about the girl one two three and four but we don't know that there's all these things that i'm like learning about this book that i feel like are it's like things people point out to me that sound right but i <laughs> didn't mean that to happen but then i wonder if i meant to subconsciously yeah because it, it makes perfect sense you know and I, I, now I sound crazy because I can't like go into detail without spoiling the book. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's like the end is kind of a cliffhanger unless you really think about what happened throughout the book. If you think about what happened throughout the book, then you know exactly what happens after that weekend, you know? Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to realize that too. Cause even I like thought, oh man, like what happens to this guy and i'm that guy <laughs> but it so once i thought about it for a while it hit me that if you actually paid attention to what happened in the book then you know but because i wasn't planning because that's not what i planned i didn't exactly make it i didn't draw like i didn't connect the dots so you could figure that out yeah. because that wasn't the plan yeah. but people have pointed that out to me and i'm like oh yeah no if you if i guess if you like think about it you know exactly what happens, you know? Um, do you have any plans for a follow-up? You know, I never thought I was gonna write a book in the first place. Um, I've written screenplays in the past, um, and I, I've written a lot of like essays and stuff. Um, yeah, I never thought I was gonna write a book, and I, I kind of have a couple ideas for books, but I have, way more ideas for screenplays. And I really want to adapt this into this, some kind of series. Um, and I don't know if you've seen like the the news, but um, Tyler Posey recorded the audiobook. Yeah, yeah. And um, he's like super into the book and he, he like wants to do a series of it if the series is made. And so that just means I got to write a screenplay. Actually was thinking that the whole time I was reading, I'm like, this would be really good as like a TV show or a series because it's very cool. visually appealing. You already can kind of see what's happening in your head just from reading it, but. Yeah, awesome. I'm glad that, yeah. I'm glad, I, I think, I don't think anybody's ever said that. And I'm, <laughs> I'm so like, I don't like reading books with a lot of description. Um, and so I just don't expect that I'm, I'm good at painting a picture, but um yeah it's good to good to hear that <laughs> <laughs>
we definitely are. Cool. <laughs> we definitely are. Yeah. It's I. Um, in all of your flashbacks, I can definitely like feel myself in the scene, and you know, even like the stream of consciousness stuff like that. You're not even thinking about that, but that's like putting people into the story too. So. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I, so when I read the book, I listened to the audiobook and read it at the same time. Oh, cool. Um, just because I have not read in a very long time. And I was like, I, I want to read this book. It's really exciting. I can't get distracted. And so I had like Tyler's voice, like reading, oh. I was like following along and it felt like, um, I was in school or something. I was like, oh, I'm like getting read to by <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I um, I was gonna ask if you had the link to Tyler's reading, uh, yeah. because he, because I recorded it myself first, oh, um, no. because I wanted to, because to put the audiobook out, like I mean, you heard it, so the songs are in there, yeah, and I have to license those songs. I can't just include them, um, and so I recorded it myself in case like bands wanted to see what I want, was planning on doing, or labels or publishers. And so I have the whole thing recorded with my voice, um, but I'm not an actor and I'm barely a reader. Um, it's so like, it, it's, it's good. I mean, I, it's fine, but Tyler just took it to a whole other level. Like he became the character, he like performs the book and it's so great. Like, I love, I love what he did with it. And I'm, I'm like four songs, four or five songs away from having it completely cleared um and so once those songs come through i guess it'll get released at some point um but yeah so hopefully that'll be out by the end of the month but i don't know man i'm getting some trouble from some people uh, hopefully. all the bands have been cool all the songs are cleared by all the bands or their management but it's these goddamn label people not label people but publishers like sony publishing and universal publishing um they're they're the ones i'm running into a little a little struggles with but man i've it's been so many people have been so great like aj from the dangerous summer like emailed hopeless records and asked them to let me use their music for free so there's three dangerous summer songs in there um chris caraba from dashboard confessional like i met with him and talk, told him about the book and stuff and gave him a copy and he told me that like if i couldn't get hands down like the album version and that's one of the songs i'm having trouble with from universal yeah. that he owns two different versions of the song he's like you could have either one of those and so like freaking chris caraba was just like gave me a version of hands down to use for free in the book you know that's awesome um, so that's a lot of very cool things have happened with that and so i it's a lot of hard work but i can't stop doing it because so many people have been so awesome about it yeah i think that that's what's great about just the music community in general is that yeah everyone is just so willing to help each other and is really excited when like really cool and different projects like this no exactly like i mean i talked to some guys from one of the guys from acceptance um because their song so contagious is in there um and he was like i think sony owns it but i don't know if they know they own it so you should just go ahead and use it of course, I'm not going to do that because then Sony is going to sue me or something. Um, but like, yeah, no, everybody in the bands and management side has been so cool about, you know, understanding what it is because they understand the scene in this community. Yeah. But then you get to like Universal and I mean, there's even some big publishers who have been super cool about it, like Concord, who bought Victory Records and bought Fearless Records and owns their catalogs. They just let me use all the Bayside songs for free. And, um, you know, the part of, of Mayday Parade song that they own, they, you know, let me let me use that too. Because um, they own all the publishing and stuff. So there's, there's some big companies that have been cool about it. It's just, I'm just running into the last couple obstacles. Yeah. Oh, that Mayday Parade song is one of my favorite songs. Yeah, man, they're so great. Like that was included. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great song. As long as this book is out, 50% of the royalties are going to go to charity. And um, so currently in October, the, um, that donation is going to 
the Continuance Foundation, which is an amazing organization that provides mental health services to touring musicians and studio musicians. So um, like they're actually helping them get therapists and meditation programs and yoga and just like actually walking them through mental health recovery, not just pointing them in the direction to go. Um, and also hope for the day. So if anybody buys this book on Amazon or anywhere through October, half the royalties are going to those charities. And then in November, um, they're going to be going to um, military mental health charities um, in honor of Veterans Day. Um, mm -hmm. And I, like, like I said, I was in the army for a little bit and have seen how hard it is for a lot of people who you know have to adjust to that lifestyle. So um, yeah, and then after that, I'm not sure because like I'm keeping I'm keeping it open and not making early commitments because of new needs arising. Yeah. Um, August and September, or no, June, July, and August, I donated to uh, For the Nomads and Music Cares to help out um, musicians and crew who have no work right now. Um, and then you know. George Floyd happened and all the Black Lives Matter stuff happened. And, you know, there, I, I would have loved to have donated to, and I donated myself, but like, I would have loved to donate a, a portion of the royalties to, you know, civil rights organizations and stuff, but they were already committed to these other organizations. So they're always going to go to charity for as long as this is around. I can't tell you who right now or anything, but it'll always be like mental health stuff or civil rights stuff um, or, you know, helping out the scene, like save our stages and stuff like that. So if you're, if you get this book, you're helping out a lot of people. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's, that's great too. Um, it's helping out people just by putting out and reading it and then helping out people with like monetarily. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so many people need it right now too. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a full-time day job still and my wife does too. So, um, we can uh, we can afford to do what we can right now. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today, Mike. I really appreciated our chat. Yeah. I loved the book and I hope other people will go out and check it out and give it a read because it's Sweet. a good book. All right, no, thank you very much for talking about it. Yeah, yeah. All right, bye guys. <laughs>